Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Suspense. The adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Dragnet. And now, Gangbusters. Welcome to the Film Detective Podcast, where we bring you theater of the mind programming from the golden age of radio. I'm your host, Carl Amari. This time, John Dixon Carr hosts Murder by Experts from 1949. Stick around. We'll be right back. In 1949, Mutual Radio brought Murder by Experts to its airwaves. Each week on Murder by Experts, listeners were delivered a crime story selected by an expert, usually a detective story author. Truth be told, the producers had simply made an agreement with the Mystery Writers of America to use the names of its members in endorsing the stories, but the authors themselves had little, if any, to say in selecting the scripts. John Dixon Carr, a well-known author of detective fiction who had many of his own stories featured on Suspense and other mystery programs over the years, served as host. Attaching him to Murder by Experts gave the new series instant credibility and helped it to gain a loyal audience. The casts included many of the great voice actors from New York, including Maurice Tarplin, Raymond Edward Johnson, and Santos Ortega. In the very first year, the series was acknowledged as tops in its field by the Mystery Writers of America, receiving the Edgar Allan Poe Award as the best radio thriller on the air in 1949. Even with all its accolades, though, Murder by Experts could not attract a network sponsor. In this episode, a woman marries a writer who may turn out to be the scalpel killer. Here's The Dark Island on Murder by Experts from August 8, 1949. Murder by Experts. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts. With your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world-famous mystery novelist and author of the recently published bestseller, the life of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Good evening. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery novelist William Irish. From the many thrillers he has read and enjoyed, Mr. Irish has selected a most unusual story of mounting terror by Sidney Morris. And now we present Gertrude Warden and Bernard Grant in The Dark Island. Look now at the small tree-covered island, lying in darkness several miles off the rocky coast of Maine. Now and then, the moon breaks through the clouds, revealing for a few brief moments the figure of a girl pacing back and forth on the boat landing by the water's edge. She watches anxiously as a small launch approaches the island. (laughs) Why doesn't he hurry? Why doesn't he hurry? I won't stay on this island another moment. Not another moment. You all right, ma'am? I saw your emergency flare from the mainland. I came right away. Oh, thank heavens you're here, Sheriff. I couldn't have stood it another minute. I was going out of my mind. Why are you crying? What's wrong? What's the trouble, ma'am? Take me to the mainland. Take me to the mainland. Oh, sure, ma'am. Sure. But don't you think please, first you please better take... take me away from here. Take me away. Yeah. Let me help you in. 
<laughs> All right, sit over here, ma'am. Before I shove off, is there anything you want from the Lord? No, no, just get me away from here. Get me away. Just as you say, ma'am. This is my office. And have a seat. Thank you. Now, suppose you tell me what's happened, huh? It's like a nightmare. A confused nightmare. All of it. I, I'm so mixed up. I can't tell any longer what part of it was real and, and what part was my imagination. I, just calm down, ma'am. Tell it to me in your own way. Now, now, think back. Must have had some starting point. Things uh, generally do. Some starting point. Yes. Yes. It began that morning I saw him for the first time. Could it have only been last spring? A small boat put in at our dock, and Philip came walking up the path to the lodge. I can see him now, tall and sunburned, with the wind blowing through his blonde hair. He was the handsomest man I'd ever seen, despite the long, cruel scar on his cheek. He smiled for a moment as he saw me, and then he spoke. Hello there. Hello. They told me over on the mainland that you have an empty cottage here. Would you care to rent it to me for a few months? Rent the cottage? Why, my father would never have rented it. The people on the mainland know that. Yes, they told me, but this island looks so peaceful, so secluded. I thought I'd ask personally. Do you think it would do any good at all if I were to speak to your father? Oh, my father died three months ago. Oh, oh I'm very sorry. They, they didn't mention that back at the hotel. It is quite all right. I hope you won't think I'm being inquisitive, but who else lives on this island? No one. I live alone. Alone? Yes. Isn't it rather lonely? Oh, no. I'm quite used to being alone. Even when my father was alive, I was alone most of the time. What about visitors from the mainland? Oh, father discouraged them. As a result... No one never comes here. Father even educated me himself. He was a doctor. Really? Uh, well, so am I. My name is Duval. Philip Duval. Oh. Well, I'm Eve Winters. Wh Winters? Uh-huh. Well, your father wasn't by any chance Dr. Malcolm Winters, was he? Yes. Well, this is a surprise. I've read both of your father's books on criminal psychology. Oh? Oh, yes. He had great perception, great understanding of the criminal mind. <laughs> Well, I know very little about it. Oh, yes, of course. I do hope you'll forgive me my curiosity. But, um, why did your father give up his position in the medical world and simply disappear without a trace? I don't know. I should very much like to have met him. You see, I, too, am writing a book on criminal psychology. That's why I need the cottage, so I can work undisturbed. Oh, I see. Yes, it's just impossible to work at the hotel. There's so much talk going on about the murder that murder? I find... Murder? Yes. Haven't you heard? No. I'm afraid I know very little of what happens on the mainland. Well, perhaps it's just as well as... There's been too much talk about it already. Oh, no, please. I want to hear about it. This morning, a young girl was found murdered. She'd been slashed to death. Oh, how horrible. It was another scalpel killing, exactly like the other two. You mean there were others besides the poor girl found this morning? Yes. In the past two months, three women have been killed in identical fashion. Their throats cut by a surgeon's scalpel. A surgeon's scalpel? Yes. Well, have they caught the murderer yet? No, 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 no. The authorities were questioning everyone this morning, but they'll never catch him. He's far too clever for them in their stupid methods. They don't realize that they're dealing with a mind that's... <laughs> Seems I'm always giving a lecture. Goodbye, Miss Winters, and if there's anything I can do for you, I'm staying at the Stratford Hotel. 
Well, thank you, but I never go to the mainland. Goodbye. Uh, doctor? Yes? Um, there's really no reason why I shouldn't let you use the cottage. So, if you still want to... Well, that's most generous of you. You have no idea how much this means to me. You can move into the cottage any time. Well, it, it so happens that everything I own is in the boat. So there's no need for me to go back to the hotel. Oh, I see. I'm most grateful for the cottage, Miss Winters. And I promise I'll do my best to keep out of your way. Within an hour, he'd moved in. A week went by. And except for the glimpses I caught of him writing at his desk by the window, I saw very little of him. And then one day we met at the well, and soon we were meeting every day. Strange the way one can be so lonely, and then suddenly life becomes wonderful, each day happier than the last. But one day Philip would finish his book and leave, and once more I would be alone. Eve, where are you? Oh, here I am, Philip. I just received a letter from my publishers. They like the 30 chapters I've already sent them. And they're going to publish the book as soon as I complete the rest. That's wonderful, Philip. You haven't much more, have you? No, just a final chapter on the Bluebeard Complex, and it'll all be finished. And then, where will you go? Go? go. <laughs> I've been so busy this past month that I, I hadn't thought about it. Somehow I've come to accept this island as my home. Perhaps it's come to mean home. Because of you, Eve. Oh, Philip. Eve, I'm a fool. I've been so busy with the book, I've never stopped to tell you how much I love you. How much I need you. Oh. If you only knew how much I wanted to hear you say that. Eve, darling, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Oh, I was happier than I thought anyone could be. A few days later, we went to the mainland and were married. We spent only a few hours on the mainland, for after 15 years of living on the island, the townspeople, the noise and constant movement were more than I could stand. Philip and I returned to the island that same day. The weeks slipped by swiftly. Philip worked on his book, and I looked after him. And then one night, after we'd been married a month, I was awakened by Philip. Eve, huh? wake what? up, what? wake up. Oh, what? Oh, Philip. What am I doing standing here by the clothes closet? I awoke to find you getting out of bed. Your eyes were wide open, darling, yet, yet when I spoke to you, you, you didn't answer. What? You just walked over to the clothes closet at, as though in a trance. And then you awakened me? Yes. Oh, how strange. I've never walked in my sleep before. Well, don't worry about it, darling. You'd better go back to bed. We'll talk about it in the morning. But with morning came the sun, and the night was quickly forgotten. Philip continued to work on his books and read unpublished medical papers left by my father. And then one morning, shortly before dawn, I awoke to find Philip's bed empty, unslept him. I quickly dressed and went to his study. He was sitting at his desk, his eyes bloodshot, staring into space. I placed my hand on his shoulder. Eve! Darling, is anything wrong? Wrong? Well, yes, you've been here all night. What were you doing? Why, I was, I was reading your father's books and the material he left at his death. Philip, there is something wrong, isn't there? I feel it. It's in this room. There's nothing wrong, Eve. It's just your imagination. You sure? Yes, of course I'm sure. All right, darling. Eve? Yes? Tomorrow's the first of the month. I promised my publisher I'd be in Boston on the first to discuss my book. It'll mean a trip away from the island for a night. Well, when do we leave? Eve, would you mind very much if I were to go alone? Alone? Well, I'll really be tied up with my publisher most of the time. Besides, you know how you hate the noise and confusion of the mainland. Well, of 
course, Philip. I, I suppose it would be foolish of me to go along. You'll be so busy. I knew you'd understand. Where, when do you think you'll leave? I'll um, have to take the noon train to Boston. I just have time to catch it. I'll be back early tomorrow evening. With that, he was gone. Something had happened that night. Something that threatened our marriage, our future. And I didn't know what it was. How empty the lodge was with him gone. I returned to the study and began to straighten out the papers on his desk. And then, as I opened one of the drawers, I saw them. Hundreds of clippings from newspapers all over the country. And all of them about the scalpel killer. Clippings? Why had he collected them? Why? And suddenly I was afraid to think about it. I began to count the minutes and hours until he should return. I never knew a night and a day could be so long. But at last his boat arrived at the dock, and a minute later he came up the path to the lodge. Hello, Eve. Oh, how are you, darling? Did you have a nice trip? A nice trip? Yes, I suppose so. Oh, Philip, is anything wrong? There's nothing wrong. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Eve. I'm, I'm, I'm just tired, oh, that's all. Oh, that's all right, darling. You, you'll feel better after you've eaten. Here, let me take your coat and the paper. Thank you. Well, is there anything in the paper? No, let me have that paper. I Why, don't... Philip, there's been another murder on the mainland. A woman found slashed to death. Oh, how horrible. Yes. Once more, the scalpel killer struck, claiming early this morning a fourth victim. Police would make no statement other than to say that the use of a scalpel by the killer indicates that a doctor... Must you go on reading that? Isn't it enough that they're dead? Why, Philip? Oh, I'm sorry, Eve, darling. I heard quite enough about it on the mainland. It was the only topic of discussion. Yes, I understand. I won't mention it again. Thank you, Eve. It's good to get away from all that talk. To me, this island represents escape. Escape from the mainland. And all that happens there. Escape? What was there to hide from? It couldn't be. It couldn't be! And yet, the clippings in his desk. The violent outburst when I'd read the newspaper story. His strange behavior in the past. A picture began to form. A picture I could no longer bear to look at. Weeks passed, and we were as strangers. And then one night, I was awakened by a pair of hands on my throat. Don't, don't be frightened, Eve. It's nothing, it's nothing. Why did you put your hands on my throat? You were tossing in your sleep. I, I oh. just wanted to see if you had a fever. No, I'm all right. Why are you trembling? I don't know. Oh, Philip, what's wrong? Nothing, Eve, nothing. It's just your imagination. No, it isn't. Has it? Anything to do with the murder of those four women? What makes you ask that? Is it because of the murder? No, I tell you, no! You must stop talking about them. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's all right, Philip. I've... I've got to make another trip to Boston to see my publisher. Another trip to Boston? Yes. I just have time to catch the morning train. How long will you be gone? Just overnight. Philip, I... What were you going to say? Nothing, nothing. Here, let me help you pack. You needn't bother. I'm only taking a few things. A scalpel. Why, well, yes, I thought I'd take your father's instruments to town, have the instruments polished. Are uh, all the scalpels in your bag? Yes. Why do you ask? Well, I, I just wanted to make sure you, you hadn't forgotten any... Oh, Philip, why do you look at me that way? I'm thinking of four women. Four women who were slashed to death. Philip looked at me for a moment. Then without a word, he left. And suddenly I realized if a murder were committed that night, there would be no escaping the truth. I could do nothing but pray and wait. 
The day dragged into the night, and at last dawn came. Soon he'd return, and I'd know everything. Everything. Eve? Oh, here I am, Philip. How was the trip? Philip, what's happened? Last night, another woman was murdered on the mainland. Oh, no. Oh, no, not another. Yes. Her throat was cut like the others. Don't tell me anymore. I don't want to hear about it. Then, then you know everything. Yes. I've suspected it for months. Only I could never bring myself to believe it. Eve, Eve, there's only one thing left to us. One thing left to us? Yes. We must die together so that innocent people may live in safety. Philip, what are you saying? I don't want to die. I know you don't, darling, nor do I, but can't you see it's the only way out? The police are bound to find them. To find them. The murderer. It's just a question of time. Look, let's not wait and live in fear. We'll go to the police and confess. No, I couldn't stand to go through all that. But I don't want to die, and I won't. Please, Eve, darling, don't make it difficult. You know I can't allow you to live. It's too dangerous. So that's it. Get rid of me so you can go on living in safety. You know better than that, Eve. I love you. When you die, I shall follow you. No! I won't let you kill I've me. I've got to, darling. I'll try not to hurt you. Philip, now you stay where you are. Stay where you I are. I pray this wouldn't be necessary. But last night's murder leaves me no choice. You must die. You, you stop following me, Philip. I'm warning you. What are you getting from under that coat? Don't move, Philip. If you come any closer, I'll shoot. After what I've been through, a gun doesn't seem very frightening. Now, I'm warning you, Philip, I'll shoot. I'm not going to die for your crimes. My crimes? Yes. You've killed five women, but I shan't be the sixth. You... You believe... You believe I murdered those five women? Well, you've admitted as much. Eve, Eve, darling, put that gun down and listen to me, please. Do you know the reason your father brought you to this island as a child? No, I don't. And... I do. And haven't you ever wondered why he practically kept you a prisoner on this island? Educating you himself. Oh, you're, you're trying to put me off my guard with this talk. Now, you stay where you are, Philip. Among the papers your father left upon his death, I found some which gave a clue as to the reason he retired to this island. What? Yes, yes. It all began when you were ten years old and lived in Boston. Your father found you one night walking through the house in a trance. Oh. Night after night, your father stayed up watching you. Then one night, while in a trance, you strangled your cat to death. Oh, you're lying! Think back to when you were ten years old. Didn't you have a cat? And then, one morning, it was gone. Well, it had run away. Father told me he so. He was hiding the truth from you. He destroyed the body. And then, a few days later, he got you another cat. And it disappeared. That cat also ran away. It didn't run away any more than the first one did. You killed it, Eve. In the same manner. Oh, you're clever, Philip. But I know something of psychology. You can't break me down with such a story and take this gun. Listen to me. After observing you for some time, your father realized you were a schizophrenic. Oh. A female Jekyll and Hyde, a split personality with uncontrollable homicidal tendencies. You won't break me down, no matter how clever you it are. It was then that your father knew that no one was safe as long as you were free. So he gave up everything he valued and brought you to this island. Virtually becoming your jailer. Oh, I'm afraid your story doesn't hold. I was always free to go where I pleased. Yes, for you weren't dangerous when you were awake. But when you went to sleep each night, didn't your father always see to it that you had a sleeping drug? No. Think. Wasn't there some special drink you took before you went to bed? Well, fully hot milk. Then that was it. As long as your father lived, he was able to control your sleeping hours. But when he died, the drug was no longer administered. And you began to walk at night in a trance. No. The first murder occurred exactly a week after your father's death. You were following your subconscious will to kill. You've never explained where you were the night that first woman was killed. A month after the first murder, you left this island again. Your father's scalpel in your hand. And another girl was found dead on the mainland. Her throat cut. I never left this island from the day I returned from my father's funeral. You never remember having left this island, for when you woke up the following day, you were back in your own room. When I came to this island and told you about the murders, you were naturally shocked. For your conscious mind was not aware of what you had done. You tell a convincing story, Philip. 
But you haven't explained why you came to this island with all your baggage just a few hours after a murder had been committed. Well, it's very and simple. And the hundreds of clippings you have. And why you tried to strangle me two nights ago. Strangle And tell me why you took the scalpels with you yesterday. Oh, no, I know you're the murderer. And I'm going to turn you over to the police. I've sunk both boats. You're... You'll never go to the police. Oh, you're mad. You're completely mad. I can't allow you to go on living. Philip, stop coming toward me. I don't want to shoot, but you're forcing me to. I've got to kill you. I've got Philip, to... Philip, don't or I'll shoot. Oh. Oh, I didn't want to do it, but you made me. It was either your life or mine. Oh, nothing you said was true, nothing. You were trying to break me with that story and then murder me as you did the others. Oh, but you failed. And I... I, I, oh, I feel so faint, so dizzy. As, uh, uh. When I recovered consciousness, I found myself in my own room. It was just dusk, and there was a deathly stillness about the lodge. I got up and went into the living room. Philip's body was on the floor, barely discernible in the dark. Fear welled up in me and I found myself screaming. I, I ran out of the lodge and down to the dock. But both boats were sunk, just as he'd said. My legs gave away and I sank to the ground. And then I remembered the emergency flares in the boathouse. I thought you'd never arrive, Sheriff. I waited and waited in the darkness and it seemed as if I were alone in the world, utterly alone. There, there, ma'am. You're all right now. You gotta get a hold of yourself. It's all over now. I didn't mean to kill him. I didn't mean to kill him. Of course you didn't. It was either him or you. Uh, you say he was blonde, six feet tall. He had a deep scar on his cheek. Yes, yes. He once stayed at the Stratford Hotel. Yes. Huh? I remember seeing him now. I recall he slipped off from the hotel when we started questioning the guests. I wondered about him a couple of times. Guess I should have followed him up. Might have saved the lives of a few innocent women. Oh, come now, ma'am. Crying won't do any good. It's all over now. You're safe. Here, here. lie down on this couch. Now, stretch out, get a little rest. That's it. A couple hours, it'll be dawn. You'll feel better when you see the sun shining. You... You won't leave me. Will you? No, ma'am. I'll stay here with you. While you're getting a little sleep, I'll write out a report of what happened. I, I, I couldn't bear to be alone. No, you won't be. Close your eyes. Try to get some sleep. That's it. That's it. Poor girl. And it's all over now. She can sleep in peace. Wait, wait, I, I want, I want to... Number, please. Agnes, get me Judge Donnelly. Oh, yes, Sheriff. Uh, hello? Judge, uh, Sheriff Mitchell calling. Uh, Sheriff, you called me at 2 a.m. and gave me a full report on the death of the scalpel killer. Yeah, uh, now, why are you calling again at 4 a.m.? I... Uh, ju judge... Yeah, sounds I... to me like you've been drinking. Now, I reckon the celebration's in order, but why bother me? Now, will you please let me get back to sleep before ju I lose... Listen, I... I haven't much time, Judge. Uh, what's that? The scalpel killer wasn't... Philip Duval. What are you saying, Sheriff? He, he, he was right. Right about what? The girl. 
Eve. The girl? Notify. Notify to be on lookout. Brunette. F five feet four. Gray eyes. You've had one too many, Sheriff. First you phone and tell me it was Duval. Then you say it's the girl. Now what proof have you got she's guilty? There, there's a scalp on the floor, Judge. And, and my throat. I'll, I'll never live to finish. To, to finish. <laughs> And so the curtain falls on the Dark Island, which was chosen by guest expert William Irish, whose latest thriller is The Blue Ribbon. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of a jealous wife and a husband bent on murder with a most unusual ending. Selected for your approval by Elysia Lipsky. Until then, this is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us next week at this time. The Dark Island was written by Sidney Morris, adapted for radio by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. In the cast were Gertrude Warner, Bernard Grant, and Maurice Tartlin. Music is under the direction of Emerson Buckley, composed by Richard DuPage. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. This is Phil Tonkin speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. And that's Murder by Experts with the Dark Island, hosted by John Dixon Carr from August 8th, 1949. Also in the cast, Gertrude Warner and Maurice Tarplin as heard over Mutual. Next time on the Film Detective Podcast, Jackson Beck stars as sophisticated detective Philo Vance from 1949, so don't miss it. To learn more about this series, visit thefilmdetective.com. See you next time.